So here we are for Swinging Doors Part 2. Now, like I said, Part 1 was part of our opening and closing statement we have. We did last week for the opening statement. This week is a closing statement. And for the closing statement, we use the, the book of Jude, which is a letter written by the Apostle Paul. But before we get into that, let's pray. Father God, I just come before you now humble. I pray you just watch over the words. Lord, you are holy and righteous, yet you choose to use broken men to preach your word. So I pray right now that the Spirit of God speaks about the Son of God and glorifies him as he talks about the work that he did for the Father God. We ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So the message today is just simply titled Swinging Doors Part 2. And as I said, for this particular one, we look at the book of Jude, which is a letter written by Paul. Now, Jude is an apologetic letter. It's a letter of correction. Now, we're at the last part of it because that's the part of Jude. It's only one chapter. So usually people say Jude verse 3 because everybody knows this chapter 1 because there's no chapter 2. Now, inside the book of Jude, at the end, it's called the doxology or the praise part of the letter. So we're running up to that part in the end of it. And it actually is preceded by a warning to the brothers and, of course, sisters that it's being written to. And it's a letter saying, hey, by the way, remember what we told you, what you learned. So go into the book of Jude. We're going to start at verse 20. And let's read it here on the screen. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in our, in your most holy faith, and praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others, show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now to him, who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. So I choose, choose, I chose this particular verse because it, I believe, is the perfect sentence to say before you walk away from fellowship with the brothers and sisters. I believe that the initial opening of it speaks of love because the word that I want to focus on in verse 20 is beloved. Beloved is an amazing word because it means that we are friends, but more than just friends, we care for one another. There is compassion. There is emotion. It's not just I know you, it's I know you in spirit. When I see your face, I get joy. When I remember our conversation, I reminisce with, with happiness. Beloved implies that we have a, a closeness. So understand that this verse is meant to just make sure we all understand what we are. We are beloved. And this is God saying it to us. And we, of course, in turn, as Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. So we say it to each other. But this is God speaking, saying, beloved. Of course, the Apostle Paul wrote it, but he's speaking from God to us, saying, beloved. So I want you to know that the, the, the closing statement opens with a love note to let you know that I care for you and we care for one another. But then it moves on and it makes some very powerful statements. I want to just highlight them. It says, building yourselves up, keeping yourselves in, and waiting for, but of course, it leads to. These are all actions. These are all uh, transitions. Building yourself up is something you're doing. It's a work being done. So it says, lover, my beloved, building yourselves up, keeping yourselves in, waiting for, and then the final point of that, which is leads to eternal life. The words in between these words are what lead to eternal life. So when you say this doxology, when you say this statement, know that you are loved. But more importantly, they're actions. They're, they're to-dos. They're, there are things that you must be pursuing, things that you must be walking through. You must be building yourself up to something. You must be keeping yourself in something. You must be waiting for something. 
All of those things equal eternal life. Now, in the second half, I want to focus on some of the words here. It says, have mercy on. Save others. Save others. Have mercy on is for you, but then once you have that mercy, the goal here is to save others. And then it says, show mercy with. Hating even, and then finally, the flesh. Now, I'm highlighting these words to see that the second part here speaks of a caution. Because once you know the Lord, once you're beloved of the Lord, you now have what you, you receive mercy, so you must give mercy. You must show mercy. And also, most importantly, because you know God, you hate certain things. And the Bible tells us that you are born again of the Spirit, and you die to the flesh. So you see the caution statements here, statement here at the end. It says, having even what? Hate having disdain for the flesh, which means your old self, things that are not of God, things that are not of the Spirit. And finally, in the, in, in, the, in the latter half of this doxology, we see here it says, praying in the Spirit. I believe this is the key to all this, is praying in the Spirit. All this does not work, church, if you're not praying in the Spirit. And this is strange because people say, well, what do you mean praying in the Spirit? because I pray to God, but how do I know I'm praying in the Spirit? And that, to me, is the miracle of our faith, because you are now the household of faith. You are now physically the temple of God, and the Holy Spirit dwells in you. And because he dwells in you, when you pray, by default, because the Spirit dwells in you, your spirit prays in concert, or next to, or with, alongside the Holy Spirit. And together, that's how we pray in the spirit. So the question becomes, when you pray, do you pray what your will be done? Or do you pray what his will be done? The Bible tells us that those who confess Jesus Christ as Lord cannot do that unless the spirit of God is in you. You can't call him Lord. You can't call him Jesus, my, my, my lover, my soul, my savior. You can say it with your mouth, but to say it with your spirit is when you feel it, is when you know it. It's something you can't deny. So I just want you to think about that for a moment as I move on. But praying in the Spirit is the key. And hopefully at the end of this message, you'll see why that's, that's so important. Because the Spirit is greater than you. The Spirit is greater than me. Because the Spirit is God. I just want to give you that, that picture. The Spirit is bigger than you. And that's a good thing. Because if you were bigger than the Spirit, there'd be a problem. Finally, it says hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now the word garment here in the, in, in the Greek, there's two types. There's the outer garment, the tunic, or the inner garment, the undergarment. Today we call those your underclothes, your underwear. This word here, garment, means the underwear. Hating even the stained garment, the stained underwear by the flesh, which means by sin, by, by error. So before this though, it tells you to have compassion, have mercy, snatching those out of fire. But it gives a caution. You don't snatch people to the point that you touch their undergarments. Now, I'm giving you graphic language because it uses that to say, be careful how you try to snatch people out because you might stumble. We know in other verses of scripture, it tells us to be careful that when we call somebody out of their sin, that we don't stumble ourselves. That we don't walk around as hypocrites. So you can, of course, call your brother and sister out in sin because you love them. Not because you want to wag your finger at them, but you got to be careful that you don't get so deep into that that you also now get defiled. Now, I say this because I have friends that I know that are Christians and family members that are Christians that get in situations that do not call for them to be involved. For instance, my friend wants to go see a movie that I know is not good for me to see, but I want to win him to Christ, to her to Christ. So I'll go with them to see that movie that I know for me it's not right. Or... I go to a party where they're playing and doing things that I should not be listening to or doing. Or, or, or. So the caution here is to go and love those and help to snatch them out the fire. But take heed that you don't get yourself dirty. Take heed that you don't get yourself defiled in showing mercy to others. Because sometimes the answer is just, no, I can't go. Or no, I can't that. I love you, but I hate that more than I love you. And I love him more than I love you. 
So this is a very quick line, and there's more to be said here, but it, it's a caution because I think sometimes we go to places where we want to love on people and, and speak to people about Jesus, but we put ourselves inside harm's way. We put ourselves in positions where we touch undergarments that are soiled. We get too close to things. The undergarment is something that you, you don't get somebody's undergarments quickly or easily, right? You have to go through something, around something, under something, over something. Now I'm giving you graphic visuals to understand that it takes effort to get there. It's not just simply boom, it's there. You have to willfully make a move for that. That undergarment has to file. Remember, it says flesh here. So let's move on. I wish to beat that. So inside this particular verse, the second half, which is verse 24 to 25, I want to just focus on this part right here. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Now, it begins with now saying, okay, pay attention. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Everything that preceded this, everything that was before this is because of his power. Jesus is the one that keeps you from stumbling. So I just want you to, again, the spirit in you is what allows you to pray to the Father and worship the Son and be able to have your prayers be in the spirit. But number two, which of course precedes number one, which is Jesus is the one that keeps you from sinning, that keeps you from stumbling, that keeps you from falling. Now, why am I saying this? This statement we say as we go out, as we exit, as we leave to go out and do whatever we're going to do after this. The purpose of this particular line is to remind you that you are not the one that gets the glory. You're not the one that has the power. Nor are you the one that keeps yourself. He keeps you. The most important part of the gospel that you have to ask is how am I saved? And you're saved because he keeps you from stumbling. You're saved because he keeps you from sinning. You're saved because he keeps you from lying. You're saved because he keeps you from judging, prejudging, or doing anything that is of the flesh. And by God's grace, he sends you the spirit, which seals you, which convicts you, which dwells in you, which walks with you, and keeps you from falling. Now, to make this clear to you, I want to show you what the world of faith was like without the Spirit of God in people, nor having the blood of Christ covering people. To do that, I want to go back to an Old Testament book, the book of Exodus. And we're going to read that book for the rest of the night, except for the end. So if you have a Bible, go to the book of Exodus, chapter 19. I believe in the book of Exodus, we get, we get to see an example of what does it mean like to know the truth of God, but have a hard time keeping it. Because we see here in our verse, it says, to him who is able to keep you and you and me from stumbling. This is a powerful statement. It should comfort you when you walk out to know that your steps are ordered and kept by him. That if you do stumble, he knows that and he'll catch you. But let's look at Exodus. And I want to look particularly in Exodus chapter 19, verses 2 through 9. Because in verses 2 through 9, we have a visual like this. We have the Mount Sinai, which is smoking, has this fire on it, and God has descended upon it. We're going to start verses 2 through 9. I'm reading from my Bible. You can keep along in your Bible. But I think here we're going to see exactly what's going on. In, in uh, Exodus chapter 19, verse 2 through 9, the Word of God says, They set out from um, Rephidim, Rephidim, and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain. While Moses went up to God, the Lord called to him hmm, out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to, my, to, you, to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession all among all the peoples, or among all peoples, from all the earth is mine. That's a big one. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and, holy, and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. 
So Moses came and called the elders of the people of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. This is all the people. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe you forever. When Moses told the words to the people of the Lord. I stop there, verse 9. So we see here what's happening on Mount Sinai. God has called his people out of Egypt already. He reminds them what he did, and he did a lot. He freed them. They didn't have to raise a sword, a shield. Nobody had to throw a rock. They simply had to walk and trust. Walk and trust. Walk and trust. And they said with their own mouth, whatever you say, Lord, or Yahweh, God, we will do. And Moses blessed, said, okay, went back to God. And God said, you know what? I want them to come closer so I want to hear me talk to them directly. So God says, I know you trust Moses, but I want them to hear me talk to them directly so that they'll trust you forever, which is a big deal here. Now, we know after this, Moses, God speaks, and what he speaks is the Ten Commandments. In the Ten Commandments, God lays out to their hearing his law, his statutes, his commandments. I'm not going to read them out. I just want to set to you in front of you a picture of what's happening. God drew them out himself. He drew the people. He saved them. He told them. He saved all of them, millions of them, and drew them across the desert, saved them, and then brought them all the way to this point where he now speaks to them face to face from a mountain. And he says these amazing 10 things to them. And I want to, us now to fast forward to chapter 20 at the end. We're going to look at verse 18 to 24 because this is after the Ten Commandments, after God's law, after God's word has been spoken. Let's see now what happens. Just four simple, uh, six simple verses, starting at verse 18. The word of God says, Now, when all the people saw the thunder and the flashing of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled, and they stood far off and said to Moses, you speak to us, and we will listen. Do not let God speak to us, lest we die. Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. And the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall no, thus you shall say to the people of Israel, You have seen for yourselves that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make gods of silver to be with me, nor shall you make for yourself gods of gold. An altar of earth you shall make for me and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. So we see here God speaking to his people. Now I'm trying to draw a picture here for you. He called his people out. He saved them. Again, all they had to do was walk and obey walk and obey. He fed them. He clothed them. The clothes never ran out. They didn't have a want or need for anything. When they were thirsty, they had water. When they were hungry, they had food. You know the stories. The manna from heaven, etc., etc. And I'm trying to see here if you can see with me that God does all the work. And these brothers of ours and sisters of ours, all they had to do was walk and obey. All they had to do was walk and obey. Now, we're going to jump ahead now because I want to get to the point of our wisdom where we can learn something. So jump to Exodus chapter 31. So right now we're at 20. Jump to 31. And in particular, I want to jump to verses 1 through 11 in Exodus 31. I believe here we'll see something amazing because not only did he bring them. Now, Moses was up on this mountain for a while. We just jump from chapter 20 to chapter 31, and God is still talking to Moses. And he told Moses a lot. Starting at verse 1 of chapter 31. 
the Lord said to Moses, see, I have called by, I've called by the name um, Bezalel. Bez, 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 I always practice these names. I jack them up every time. The son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship. God did that to him. God called him out. God gave him the skill. So, um, four, to devise artistic designs to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, and in carving wood to work in every craft. And behold, I have appointed with him all of um, Oholib, 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 I will jack it up too, Oholib, the son of um, Ahisamash, oh wow, that's tough, of the tribe of Dan. And I have given to all able men ability, uh, to all able men ability, that they may make all that I have commanded you, the tent of meeting, the ark of the testimony, the mercy seat that is on it, and all the furnishings of, of the tent, the table and its utensils, the pure lampstand with all of its utensils, and the altar of incense, and the altar of the burnt offerings with all of its utensils, and the basin and its stand, and the finely worked garments, the holy garments of Aaron, the priests and the garments of his sons, for the service as priests, and the anointing oil and the fragrant incense for the holy place. According to all I have commanded you, they shall do. So we see here, before Moses is done, God says, I give you all these specifications for everything I need you to do to be able to be with me and the people. And I've equipped the people, I've anointed, I've called out people. Mind you, did anybody say, God, give me this gift? Did anybody say, God, can I have that ability? No, God gave it to them as he saw fit. And God told Moses, when you get back there, they already have it. You don't have to tell them. You don't have to wake them up. You don't have to teach them. Again, God is the one doing the work, preparing his people to do what? Worship him. And what do you have to do? Just walk and obey. So what happens? So now we get to the fun part. We go to the part where I think all of us have to take heed. If you are zoning out this whole sermon, please focus and zoom in right now. Pay attention. This is the most critical part. Everything that's happened up to this point has been God, 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 and God. And they said with their own mouth, anything you say, we will what? We will do. And even when God, the God spoke to them face to face from heaven, what did they say? Moses, you go and let, let, talk to God. Because we talk to him, he's just too scary. But whatever he tells you to tell us to do, we'll do. And he told him before he went. God was very specific before he had Moses come up. He said, I will be your God. Do not create any image of me made of silver and of gold. Amen? So let's see what happens. We're looking at Genesis chapter 32, verse 1 through 7. In verse 1 through 7, let's see what our brothers and sisters did. There's the words will be on the slide now. Verse 1 of Exodus 32. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to, to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, "Take off your, the rings of gold that you, the rings of gold that are in your ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me." So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in the ears and brought them to Aaron. Notice they brought the gold that was in the ears. Isn't that ironic? How the ears are meant for listening, and the words that came through their ears. So do not use silver or gold, but what do they take the gold from? Their ears. They probably had gold in their wrists and gold elsewhere, but they took all the gold from their ears. Verse 4, and he received the gold from their hand, which means that they gave it to him. They were willing and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods. O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The people are declaring this. 
Verse 5. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the capital L, Lord. If you notice in your Bibles, God's was always a lowercase g. Up until that point, Aaron switches it and makes it an uppercase L versus a lowercase L. Verse 6, And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Not to worship, to play. Verse 7, and the Lord said to Moses, go down to your people whom you, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. Now I stop here because I want you to see something. This whole time, God did everything. And they said, whatever you say we will do, and God gave them prohibitions. He gave them warnings before Moses went away. And they said, whatever Moses, whatever he tells you, we will do. They didn't put a time limit on it. They didn't say, okay, we'll wait 40 days, 40 nights. They didn't still say, they'll wait. They waited 400 years to be saved. They, waited, they were 40 years and 40 days in the wilderness. So I'm just letting you know that this issue that our brothers and sisters have, brothers and sisters today, we have the same problem. We are impatient. God speaks to us clearly his will. And oftentimes, not only do we forget, we take it and twist it like they did. And we say, what God did, I did, or he did, or she did, or it did. And we don't give proper claim, proper ownership, proper authority to God for what he did. And if you remember, at the end of our statement, the closing part, we say four things about our Jesus. We say majesty, sorry, we say glory, majesty, dominion, and authority. We give him his proper praise. That's why I think our closing statement is so important, because it reminds us not to put our trust our authority, our, our energy into anything, anybody, any place else other than Jesus. I'm going to say it again. Our brothers and sisters in the past messed up, but God's teaching us a lesson that if we stay away from our Lord long enough, shoot, he can be just right there on the mountain, and we forget. We somehow have amnesia, and all of us stumble in various ways. But thanks be to our statement that we say now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. This is why it's important to know that this statement isn't just something you run by. I just read you a long bunch of scriptures to showcase to you that you can hear from God directly. God can save you from fires, from slavery, from horrible things, and yet and still, Minutes, hours, or even days or months later, you forget. And this statement, hopefully every day, will serve as the reminder, kind of like you're tying the string to your finger, to let you know that your ability to stumble, your ability to fall, is not in your power. It's in his power, because he keeps you from stumbling. He keeps you from falling. So the question that comes when you see that you're slipping, what do you do? Aaron was a priest. He was anointed by God to be the spokesperson of God, of the people to God, and to God to the people. And what did he do? When they came and said, hey, you, up, make us a God. Did he check them? Did he correct them? No. He went right along with them. And if you read further on, when Moses quizzes Aaron, what happened? He said, I don't know. They just took their gold and threw it in the fire and poof. A golden calf appeared. Lying becomes easy to you. Be, brothers and sisters, be careful. When you touch garments that are defiled, that are fleshy, it takes you but a second to go from zero to 100. It is so easy 
when a thought becomes something more than that, when a word becomes something more than that, when an action becomes a lifestyle, and a lifestyle becomes a habit, all because you did not take heed to make sure that when you got close to undergarments, things that should not be in your presence, things that should not be in your way, and you drew to them, and you somehow got comfortable with them, you didn't realize that you are holy. You forgot that you are a purchased people, that you are beloved, that you are his precious purchase. He calls you beloved, and you call him, huh? So I'm just giving you more emphasis on this power that our Jesus has. He keeps you from stumbling. He saved you from his wrath, that you might be saved for his glory. That's why the gospel is beautiful. That's why we rejoice and trust in the Lamb. So, if you see here, I'm trying to emphasize that the statement we read has to do with as we walk out of this place, we can glorify our Jesus. We can give him praise because we know that as we move and we mess up, we will. I do. That my stumbling, which sometimes is in many ways, is because he is the one keeping me. If I kept myself, I wouldn't stumble. I would just be dead. Sinners don't stumble. They're dead. Saints stumble. I'm going to say it again. Saints stumble, which means you're walking, which means you move. So be, be, be encouraged by the fact that you can stumble because before you weren't stumbling, you were just dead. Corpses don't stumble. They just lay there and, <laughs> and dead. They rot. So... I want to at least leave you with some sort of encouragement about this because this statement that I, I read to you wasn't meant to just give you an understanding of what you should run from, but what you should look forward to. So turn to me with the book of Hebrews. Now I'm chapter, just Hebrews chapter 3. And in the book of Hebrews, I believe we find what the last statement of our, what the last part of our statement of, 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 of our doxology tells us. And why do we trust him? Why is he the reason why we have joy? Why is he the reason we have safety? So if you go to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1 through 6, you see here written in the scriptures what I believe helps us understand better our doxology. So the word of God says this. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than, than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant, to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as son, and we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. So I hope that as you exit, as you leave here week after week, this small group, but more importantly, your church, your home, that you remind yourself that you are beloved, that he tells you to do some things, which is to make sure that you are striving, that you are seeking his face in prayer, that you pray in the spirit, that when you don't know what to say, you trust that he is there listening and guiding you, that everything that you ask for, you ask by his power, by his mercy, by his grace, but more importantly, that you put him in the middle of that, him in the front of that, and him in the back of that. We don't wishful think, we don't wishful pray, we pray to a God who is eager, who is loving, who wants to know that you know him, who wants to feel that you feel him, that wants to know that you trust him. And you do that because you believe that he is risen and that he is alive, that he's not dead. But more importantly, he reigns. So as we finish this simple section, all of us, as we walk through life, walk through doors. We exit someplace. Exit it knowing that he loves you because he calls you beloved. 
Exit it knowing that he does all the work because he's the one that kept you. Exit it knowing that if you stumble, if you fall, that he catches you. Knowing that he catch you, he revives you, he refreshes you, and he gives you strength to carry on. And sometimes we crawl for a while before we walk again. Sometimes we just shimmy for a while before we walk again. But know that whatever state that you're in, you're still just stumbling and you're not dead. So as we finish up this short series on swinging doors, as you leave here, you're going to walk through many doors in life. Some of them are rotating doors. But know that as you go, give him praise. As you enter, give him praise. Give him his honor. Know that whatever you're about to walk into, he is before you. And as you exit, know that he's the one that seals you. He keeps you. He loves you. And because of that, he'll never forsake you. Let's pray. Father of lights, I just thank you for your word, your testimony about yourself. That you tell us clearly in your scriptures that you are the initiator. That you do all things for your own good pleasure. And that you have carved out a people, a precious people for yourself. And that you tell us through Christ and his testimony that you loved us because you sent him to come for us. That we might know you, trust you and follow you. Help us to learn from the, the Israelites that simply hearing you speak is not enough. That simply understanding that you have laws is not enough. That we have to trust you in everything. That we have to give authority to you in everything. That we should declare your glory as we come and sing your praises as we go. Give us, Lord, this day our daily bread and keep us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom Yours is the power, and yours is the glory, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, church.